Well hello it's Andrew here again and today is episode 55 and uh, it's continuing a little series in Matthew, Matthew's Gospel. Today we're looking at uh, verses, chapter 13 verses 47 to 50 and it's the parable of the dragnet. We're coming close to this clip of uh, parables, so close to the end of it. So we pick it up at uh, verse 47. Oops, got an itch. Excuse me, I've got to have a coffee, I've got to go out shortly. Mm. Again, the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus, is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good fish into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hmm. Well, this, excuse me, this is, is problematic for me. Um, and it may be after this you're going to stop watching. <laughs> be that as it may. I've never subscribed to the teaching of the church I grew up in, that the unsaved were condemned to eternal conscious punishment in the fires of hell. This raises serious questions about the nature of God. And subscribing to this teaching ultimately led me to asking, what kind of God is this that you worship? For me, you ultimately become the kind of person that is reflected in your image of God. If your God is just, judgmental and punitive, you will almost certainly reflect this in your own person in your dealings with others and with yourself. You will be miserable and almost certainly will make those around you miserable as well. Under this model of evangelism, people will invariably be frightened into the kingdom rather than loved into it. It was not the love of God that drew many so much as the fear of the alternative. Sinners in the hands of an angry God Becoming a follower of Jesus, then, was effectively taking out a form of eternal life insurance. I'd have to say, <coughs> pardon me, it's probably what it is, how it was, <coughs> in many ways. Because while I say that I never subscribed to this idea, it clearly affected me. Anxiety was a constant companion. An awareness that I wasn't good enough and deserved to be punished. Part of the problem is that so much of the way we read and interpret scripture is based on fear. We look <coughs> for the worst. We anticipate the worst. We expect the worst. Even in this passage, we read through the eyes of catastrophization. We overlay an interpretation which may not be warranted. The idea that God loves us <clears throat> Even in our defectiveness and our weaknesses and failings is something that sounds just too good to be true. But it is true. It has taken me years to embrace this good news. There is still slippage. There are still times when I doubt the goodness of God, trusting more to my own corruption, perfidity, and worthiness of punishment. <clears throat> Yet the trajectory of my life in encounter with God has ever been toward restoration, toward wholeness, and toward the reception of a generous and loving and abundant grace. The question that the faith of my youth raises is, again, what kind of God is this that you worship? <clears throat> One who would condemn you to an eternity of suffering for a few short, misinformed and misused years this side of eternity? What kind of God is that? Certainly not the one that I encounter, either in the teachings or in the walk alongside Jesus. <clears throat> so what are we to make of this passage? Well, it certainly raises questions. I've long been a subscriber to the doctrine of conditioned immortality, embraced by such luminaries as the father of 
20th century evangelical Anglicanism, uh, John Stott. In this view, those who ultimately reject the grace of God simply cease. There is no immortality of the soul. The whole idea that the soul goes on either in a state of bliss or in a state of misery forever and ever is not a biblical concept, it's actually Greek. Existence in the conditioned immortality um, position simply stops. Interestingly, many find this <clears throat> much more offensive than the concept of eternal hellfire. I guess they hold to the view that where there's hope, there's life, even if it is in an eternity of excruciating pain, misery and regret. Eternal life, though, I think the biblical view, is found only in direct relationship with God. In his great prayer to uh, the Father in John 17, Jesus puts it this way. John 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. There is no eternal life outside of this relationship. A relationship of intimacy because that's what the word to know that they may know you here implies it implies a relationship of deep intimacy eternal life is describing the nature of the relationship of with God it's not just about a life that never ends it's a particular kind of life it's a peculiar shape of a life it's a connected interdependent related life In this relationship, this one which we're invited to join, outside of it, there is nothing. Outside of that relationship, there is no life, eternal or otherwise. I like the image of uh, perichoresis, the divine dance of the Trinity. It's a dance of intimacy where the members of the Trinity dance together and we are invited to join in. In this relationship, there is life. Again, as I said, outside of it, there is nothing. It may be that this kind of relationship is the last thing that many would want. For them, the trajectory, habit, and focus of their lives mean that there is no room for such a relationship. For them, it would be hell. I love the way that Dallas Willard put, up, put it. And let's be clear, Willard was no soft and gushy liberal. He was a solid Southern Baptist professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California. Very good biblical expositor and scholar, though. He put it this way. I believe everyone will be in heaven who can possibly stand being there. Oh, that's beautiful. I suggest that there are many of us that just might need to be in an adjustment period first. This is where the fire comes up. Fire is used consistently throughout scripture as an image of purification, of refining. In the New Testament, Paul also uses it in this sense. I quoted a passage a few days ago, which I'll quote again, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. This is Paul speaking. And someone else is building on it. <clears throat> but each one should be careful how they build. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, your work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each one's work. If what you have built survives, you will receive your reward. If it is burned up, you will suffer loss. You yourself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So here we are with singed eyebrows. Even the image that Jesus gives of being cast into the fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing. I love that word. I know it's gnashing, but I just love the gnashing of teeth has no sense of this going on forever. This is an interpretation that we add to it. There almost certainly would be, as the Amplified Version puts it, weeping 
over sorrow and pain, and grinding of teeth over distress and anger. It could be read as being purgative, as being restorative, as burning off that which cannot be taken into the he kingdom of heaven kind of life. It may be that for some, when all this is burned off, there is nothing left. One of the best books I've ever read on the subject is The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. I think I've probably read most of his Christian works, his Christian literature, very close to all of it, most of it. And I'd have to say that for me, this book, The Great Divorce, is his finest. It touches me at a very deep, it's very challenging, very insightful and very rich. And it presents a compelling picture of the difference between hell and heaven. And what holds us back from moving to the lower, to the higher place. I think it needs to be on every Christian's reading list. It's still readily available. I checked this morning. Uh, if you live in New Zealand, you can have it delivered to your door by book depository for the total princely sum all up of $17.29. As I say, it I checked this morning. It's a, it's a good deal. It's a great book. You might be wondering, Andrew, are you an, a universalist? Well, no, I'm not. A universalist is this idea that ultimately everyone will be saved and in heaven, even Satan. No. I'd like to be. As one teacher I respect once said, if we were all truly Christian, we'd want universalism to be true. I think, though, that Lewis's book demonstrates why such an outcome is probably unlikely. People, in the end, get to make their own choices about where they want to be. In the end, I'm with Dallas Willard. And I'll repeat what he says, that where everyone will be included in the kingdom of heaven who can possibly stand being there. Peace be with you, friends. Peace be with you.